I'm going to talk to you about a, a project uh, that is huge. Uh, this is something that the government allocated $110 million to in 2008, with the parameters being that we were to do a demonstration research project in five cities in Canada, and that was it. The cities were named, the budget was named, and the general idea of the topic, and they came to us and said, what would we do? What do you study? How do you study it? What, a, what an incredible opportunity that was. Uh, and we are now like four years into that study. And I'm going to talk to you a bit more about one aspect of it, and that is how did we define the intervention itself, which is something that is called housing first and is now in place in Vancouver, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal, and Moncton. The, I have to tell you a bit about the project so you understand that what we're doing here is trying to work with individuals who are single adults and who have, are homeless and who have a severe mental illness. Uh, the sample is large uh, with uh, over 2,200 individuals and it's a trial so they're divided into uh, an experimental and a control group. It's a pragmatic trial. That means we're learning while, uh, in real life uh, conditions uh, in the five cities, we're learning as we go, we're using mixed methods. Uh, and we have built into it a core protocol that will ask questions about the cost and the effectiveness of this complex intervention at two levels of intensity for those with high needs and those with moderate needs, two different service delivery models. Uh, there, in addition to the common protocol, one of the things we did early on was allow each city to define the intervention themselves in the terms of a third arm. So we were prescribing what the core protocol would be in the common elements in five cities, but understood that this question of people adapting to their context was really important. So we built into the study the possibility that people could do something different that was specific to their site uh, and study it as a part of the trial. So for example, in Toronto, there's an ethno-racial specific housing first program. Uh, that's only in that city. In uh, Vancouver, there's a congregate living program that's only in that city. Uh, we're following people for 21 months. We're doing fidelity assessments and formative evaluations, and it, we have a, a strong qualitative co component to the study. So Housing First definitely fits the definition of a complex intervention in that it does have multiple interacting components. Uh, and uh, we have decided early on that in order to capture this, we were going to have to be careful about how we defined it and then do a really good job of studying what actually happened as it got implemented in the cities. And when, you, when you're trying to define an intervention or a best practice like this that you want to study, of course you go to the literature and the evidence space to figure out what, what is the most promising and where there is some strong backing. Uh, to warrant uh, putting it in place in five cities and studying it in this way. And that was available for Housing First. It was available primarily from the states and had been pioneered there and, and um, the Pathways to Housing Program in New York City uh, had done a lot of the work uh, about promoting and defining the model. But we realized early on that there were also political elements involved when you're defining an intervention. And transporting something from the states into Canada uh, can create uh, that kind of s negative system response that Sanjeev talked about. We also knew, though, that in Toronto, one of the cities we were in, there was a housing first program called Streets to Home. That was very active and had been in place for some time and uh, could also serve as a model for us, even though the research evidence there was much weaker. They'd done some convenient sample follow-up studies. So we were drawing upon both models when we were trying to define what this is. It is a very, in some, for some people it's very straightforward and for others it's very revolutionary. What we're really essentially doing is giving people who are homeless, if they choose it, immediate access to permanent housing. Rather than saying 
First, we do the outreach. First, we get you in treatment. Then we get you in a temporary setting. Then if you get better, you know, and finally, you know, if you're really well and stable, you can get a place of your own in the community. You kind of, it's housing first, not treatment first. Uh, but it's done in a way that has a particular philosophy behind it, and that is a recovery orientation. So these are kind of the key elements that both Pathways to Housing in New York City and Streets to Home, who I sat down at a table and said, what are you guys doing? What do you agree upon is housing first? These were things that everyone agreed on. It's important when you're figuring out what kind of innovation you're going to do to think about these characteristics. And you know, implementation science has helped us a lot to know what's going to help with uptake. And having a model that's compatible and adaptable is pretty important. And in this case, the thing that made it adaptable was that people were willing to modify the service delivery model. In New York City, they had always used assertive community treatment as the way of providing support to people who were put into housing. And it's an evidence-based practice that has a long history. Uh, but we were interested in the possibility of not just using assertive community treatment, but using something that was closer to what was actually the model in Toronto and streets to homes. And that's something called intensive case management. It's a case management model that uh, differs in, in many ways uh, from the assertive community treatment. And it was very fortunate that uh, we could reach agreement that we were going to try it, call it housing first, but have it adapted to the population needs in these ways. So when you go to measure whether people are actually doing what you said that they should be doing, you have to define those elements that you're going to measure, and the common ones are in the fidelity scale there, talking about housing, talking about how it relates to services, talking about treatment philosophy, which I think is probably the most important component in this particular complex intervention, and also talking about the service array that's available. What we had to do then is break down the fidelity measurement so that there were some unique features, depending on whether it was assertive community treatment or ICM. And you can see here that that then turned into different forms of delivering the basic common elements. So when you define it and then you fund it and you hire staff and you get teams in place, you obviously have to figure out, are they actually doing what you intended them to do? Uh, in this intervention. And in order to do that, you really have to build in the evaluation. And the literature on complex intervention helped us a lot to think about how we were going to evaluate the implementation. Uh, and it was very important for us to make this differentiation between the function and the philosophy of what we were doing versus the form and the particulars of how it's being delivered. And that, that was a very useful concept for us. Because it means that when we do the fidelity visits, and we've done two sets of fidelity visits one year apart in all of these 14 programs, we, we aren't as prescriptive. And we're more interested in where has there been an adaptation and where and why has there been adaptation than we are in holding people to a clear, definitive set of rules that everyone has to follow. We've got our findings coming in about how people are doing, and they're mostly positive. Uh, you know, you look at the scores, and we look at the, the practices as we go across the country, and, and, and we're pleased. But we're also learning a lot about how to adapt the intervention as we go along. For example, one of the things that we thought was going to be the case is that we thought the intensive case management would not have on those teams the same health professionals that the assertive community treatment did. Well, when you go out and you actually try to deliver this service, depending on your context, you may not be able to broker, because that's what the case management's supposed to do, broker and get these people referred and access to the services in the community. If the, if the psychiatric services aren't there, or unfortunately they're there and they want nothing to do with your clientele, then you have to adapt your model. So many of these intensive case management teams over time have added 
a, a psychiatrist sessional fee to their teams so that they have ready, ready access, just out of pragmatics. So that's a kind of example of where you learn, you kind of learn as you go, and to some extent, the, the two different models we have, have have sort of kind of merged together. Um, we've also learned that getting the apartments and the housing part of this, the housing team, is incredibly important. They've been very successful. But one of the interesting things is we didn't prescribe anything about how they were to do their work. We were so focused in on the clinical and the, res the clinical teams, the assertive community treatment, the intensive case management. We didn't put much out there about how housing teams should work. And what we found is incredible variety because people just did whatever made sense in their context. Um, and it's uh, an interesting question for us because there's such variation and we can get a sense that in some ways some cities are working easier and better than others. So one of the things that we may end up doing is trying to define a new common element of Housing First that better specifies just what it is that these uh, housing teams do when they go out and get apartments and when they work with landlords, et cetera. Um, so the, it, there's a, a, a wealth of learning, and I like Sanjeev's term around knowledge creation, that happens in this kind of process where you're not giving up on a standardized or a common definition, but you're being very thoughtful about the complexity of that definition, and then adjusting your expectations and uh, your interest in how this is going to work out accordingly. Um, this is a, a project that is huge, and I never speak without acknowledging the huge number of people across the country who've made it possible, and that includes a very large national research team that works with me at the national level, and then sets of researchers in each of the five cities uh, with uh, some of the best health services researchers in the, in the country all involved in the cities and getting this done. So a little peek of, of how you go about trying to define and think about the intervention itself. Thank you. <laughs>